at the end of the day, selling is transferring a feeling. If you don't have the feeling, you can't transfer it. If you exactly. don't have a good, positive feeling, dude, you're an actor. You have to sell and run your business from a place of positivity. And however you get there, God bless you. Welcome to the Pete Primo Show. It is episode 108, and we are here with Kurian Therakin, the founder and the managing director for Strategy Peak. He is an expert in sales. He's an expert in business. He owns his own business, and he is the author of The Seven Essential Stories of Charismatic Leaders Tell, the, an Amazon bestseller, which we are basing our whole conversation on today. Um, I'm going to just pay the bills really quickly, give a shout out to a friend, and then we are bringing Korean on. So if you haven't, why haven't you sell a million, 101 strategies, uh, to, for furniture and mattress stores to sell another million this year, hurry up, go to Amazon. It's like two cups of coffee in today's new world. And let me also say thank you to Steve and thank you to the Mattress Industry Network Group for your support. I appreciate you sponsoring the show. If you are in the mattress industry, we want you in this group. So scan the scan me code and join the group. It's absolutely free. The Mattress Industries Network core values are helping others to build, market, sell, and succeed in the mattress industry. All kinds of people are in here. Store owners, sales pros that work the retail floor, sales reps, um, owners of manufacturers, everybody that you need to know uh, is in this group. It's over 1,700 strong, maybe even at 1,800 strong at this point in time. And uh, join the group and tell them Pete sent you. Without a further to do, let me welcome Kurian. Kurian, thank you for doing the show with us. I just want to give one quick shout out to my football coach, uh, Coach Larry Van Dusen. Coach, I know that Chris Castrogano, one of my teammates, is with you right now and having lunch. I'm sorry I couldn't be there. I want to let you know I love you and thank you for everything that you did for me um, as a player and as a human being. Over the last 40 years, you know, you know, winning awards and winning championships is great. But when we take lessons into our lives from our coaches and we become successful people uh, because of those lessons uh, learned by our coaches, uh, that's something special. So thank you, coach. And thank you, Kurian. You could be anywhere, but you're here on the Pete Primo Show. I'm here on the Pete Primo Show. Thanks for having me. And ain't that the truth, Pete? You know, you remember the coaches the most. You know, it's the people that impact your lives that are beyond knowledge. You know, they're about wisdom and it's about, you know, imbibing, imbuing in you a sense of belief in yourself because they believe in you as well. Yes, yes. Uh, believed in me a lot more than I believed in myself at one point in time. I will tell you that, my friend. So why stories in leadership and why these seven essential stories? Well, stories are the only way we understand our world. If you take a, take a look at any concept that you want to communicate, you sort of have to tell it in the way of a story. It has to be done in the way of a story, right? Otherwise, it's just a boring fact. But when a fact is embedded in a story, it becomes very memorable. And the human brain, you know, through millions of years of evolution, has been especially adapted to remember and to use story to make sense of the world. So if you're not using story, you're leaving a lot of power on the table. Truer words haven't been spoken. I will tell you this. I learned it. Uh, whoever the Facebook user is, I'm guessing it's Scott Vaughn in between ups. And just so you know, I've heard from several ac accounts that said they aren't going to make it on the show because they're doing so much business on President's Day. So, guys. <laughs> Go write up that business. Do your thing. This lives on YouTube forever. So go do your thing. Um, you know, I stumbled on telling stories as a way to kind of get over the employee's anxiety that I was even speaking to him or her 
uh, because as an authority figure, you know, specifically as a general manager and a store manager, when I was in retail before I got on the wholesale side of it, immediately when you start to coach, um, defenses go up. And to me, telling a story that has the lesson in it that you want them to get just kind of lowers that resistance and it makes it not personal. Yeah. Stealth coaching comes yes. to the radar. <laughs> you know, when you hear a story, uh, when you hear a story, you can get a lesson without being accused of anything. You know, and uh, that accusations and such, uh, even though it may be perfectly applicable to you, the defense barriers are up so high that it's very difficult to uh, get the actual lesson out of it because you're not listening. You know, you're looking to just respond and be defensive in that process. So great coaches use uh, great storytelling. Um, one of the things that you had asked me earlier, why these seven stories specifically? And um, the reason why is because when I looked at it, uh, I found that, there, who is it? Um, Steve Jobs had an old marketing coach when he first started off Apple, way back when, the 70s. And there's a fellow by the name of Regis McKenna. And Regis said that great marketing takes its cues from great religion. And if you take a look at it, you know, there have been thousands of religions uh, throughout history. But today, you know, we have some very dominant ones. And they are dominant because they are able to get their message forward. And that mes message resonates. And it also is then repetitive. It, it is communicated again and again. It's resonant, right? And you have that echo factor as well. Because the stories are so believable. The stories are so uh, embedded in what people want. And what they want are these seven stories. And the stories are there because the stories are primal in nature. They answer primal questions in everybody's heads. And if you take a look at it, you know, I often say that uh, religion, uh, great marketing takes its cues from a great religion. That's right from Regis McKenna. But if you take a look at it, every business has a religion as well. Now, it's not about worshiping the boss as God. You know, it's not about that. But the religion is based in its core values, right? And the core values are then embedded in a belief system. And the belief systems are then embedded in culture. And culture is the operating system, right? And I forget who actually said that. It was a uh, fellow from the 60s, you know, that uh, culture is the operating system. But uh, that is the, the software that guides behavior, even when there is no one around to reward, punish, or uh, reward or punish that behavior. You know, no one's there to watch, reward or punish that behavior. People just know what the right thing to do is. So the religion is culture. Right. And uh, the what you worship are the core values of that organization. And then these seven stories help communicate what those core values are. So let's get into it. Give let's me a it. give me a story. Well, there's seven key stories, as I told you. Right. And the, at the very beginning, if you take a look at this, every great religion has these seven stories at the beginning. OK, in the beginning. <laughs> right from uh, Genesis. And, you know, in Christianity and Judaism and Islam, they're all Abrahamic religions. Uh, and there's always a creation story. Every religion has a creation story. How did this start? What was the inciting incident? You know, what propelled people to action? And when people understand that, they understand the motives behind why you're doing what you're doing. And when we talk about who the audience here is, it's more than just your customers. It's your employees, your stakeholders of various kinds, your investors, right? It could even be your family who then understands why you're putting in such long hours in what you're doing. So story one is always about creation and origin. And if you don't know story one of an organization, then you're missing out on a key aspect of what that is. Uh, we all know about Hewlett Packard. We all know about uh, uh, Apple Computer, uh, you know, founded in garages. And we probably know the people that were in the garage, right? And those kinds of things. And when you're deeply embedded in a brand, you want to understand that brand as much as possible. But the converse is also true. If you want your brand deeply embedded, you have to tell these stories. So question for you store owners, what is your origin story? And are you sharing it? Are you sharing it? Can, can the person 
who sells your products repeat it to the customer? Can the person who delivers the products, the last touch in the customer's home, could they repeat your origin story? These are tough questions that you should be able to answer. What's the next one? Story number two is our identity, beliefs, and values. And we talked about values a little earlier, but who are we as people? What do we believe in? What is the central organizing set of principles, high order principles, which are what values are, that guide our behavior? What must we never do, always do, and what must we, what we must always hold sacred? And so when you have these values clearly communicated, everybody gets to be able to see whether their actions are consistent and aligned with the values that the company espouses. What are the values of the business? And if you take a look at a company like Apple, you know, one of the clearest values that uh, the company has is based on design principles. And design principles are not just about how things look, it's about how they work. And uh, Apple's mm -hmm. products are some of the most fluid products on an interface basis that you can have, except for iTunes. I don't quite understand the iTunes part of it, but everything else, you know, it, it is so intuitive as to how you are to operate it. You barely need an operating manual to be able to uh, use an Apple product. How do we operate? This is great. Justin, Justin was just up. What did he have to say? Chris, can you pull Justin's comment up? I saw it there for a second and it was really, really good. And people don't work. buy products. They buy that product story and how that story makes them feel. Yeah, I absolutely agree. People don't buy from companies. They buy the story of that company and how the values relate to them. That's correct. And in fact, that goes into story three. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Let's roll. Justin, Justin, you're way ahead of the game, pal. So uh, story number three. And, this is what I say. I do a lot of coaching to startups and coach, startups, you know, I, I, the startups that I coach, uh, they're founded by engineers and scientists and they did not go to school to earn their PhD in sales. They read, they have it in chemistry and they have it in, you know, physics and things like that. Right. And so we needed a way to be able to communicate the core value propositions of why people should buy without having to embed them in some kind of a Dale Carnegie sales program or something like that, because they're not going to do that. The easiest way to do that is through story. But there's the one key story that will allow you to embed those value propositions better than any other. Now, they all seven stories work together, but this is the key story you tell. The very first thing that anybody buys, and therefore the very first thing you have to sell, the, any, the very first thing that anybody buys is the big idea. That big transformation idea from how you are going to get to where you want to go from where you are. Where are you today? Where do you want to go? And then the process to go about doing that. And that transformation story is then created through, uh, first of all, that big idea, set of key messages, and then that big transformation story, right? And when you understand that transformation story, you have a very clear idea of what your role in it is. If you are selling the big idea in a transformation story, that makes you the fairy godmother or the wise wizard. And your products are simply the tools to enable the transformation that was promised in the story, right? So the products are simply the tool sets to get you to that desired end state, the promised land. Mm. So good. So anybody listening, if you own a mattress store, or you sell mattresses in a furniture store, your transformation story is you're gonna help your customer wake up happy and pain-free or as close to happy and as close to pain-free as they humanly can be given their situation. We're not doctors, but a great night's sleep is foundational to health. As a matter of fact, um, Everybody that knows me knows I do CrossFit and CrossFit has actually changed their pyramid. And at the base of the pyramid today now is getting enough sleep because mm. without it, yeah. it doesn't matter how much we train. It doesn't matter how clean or how well we eat. We cannot recover from those intense workouts. We cannot overcome a, a lack of sleep 
because sleep equals recovery, sleep equals healing, sleep is necessary for human beings every night in the right quantity and of the right quality. So and that Pete, should what be... What else, and Pete, what I'll say to you is that, you know, sleep is the absolute desired end state. But the question now becomes for your mattress uh, sellers, your bed sellers and such. It's mattresses primarily, right? Yeah. Uh, it is about understanding what's impeding the sleep. And I forget which one of the uh, manufacturers is uh, positioning on this right now, but it's all about, you know, your partner snoring. So you have two separate beds going up and down, right? Sleep and number. Sleep number. There you go, right? And that's yeah. all about getting, you know, better sleep, not through a more comfy mattress, but rather by adjusting the heights of the various sides of the bed so that you will get a better, uh, what's a breathing pattern in your partner. It's about your partner even. It's not necessarily even about yourself. Yeah. And when you find out what they want, they, they need to get a better night's sleep. Right. But why do they need to get a better night's sleep? You know, are they healing from a surgery? Are they about to have a surgery? Uh, do, do they have something that prevents them from sleeping? Are they trying to sleep flat? and they have a lung condition that prevents them from sleeping soundly flat. And they need to elevate their bed, their head to properly breathe. Most people do. And, and anyway, uh, transformation story, the big idea. And if you can get them both in the same place, even better. Even better, right? The big idea. Well, the big idea, and, set and of products, key messages. And then uh, we go into the actual transformation story that wraps those two things together. Okay, let's do that. So is that number four and five? That's, that's number three. So creation and origin, our identity, values, and beliefs. And then the big idea is number three, th story number three. Okay. I got so excited, I started writing. <laughs> And, and these stories, stuff. once again, yeah, Pete, they're primal stories because they address the primal questions in your prospects' heads, in your employees' heads, in your stakeholders' heads. And once you fill all of these in, they understand you. They identify with you. They're resonant with your story. They may still not agree with you, but they get you. That's okay. the important part of it. So I, I have to unpack that really quickly because you said it so nonchalantly. Okay. This is for my sales reps out there. Sure. All right. In a B2B uh, sale, there's not just one stakeholder. With these biggest, bigger companies, you have multiple stakeholders. Right. You have a founder. You have a CEO. You have a president. Uh, you have the immediate buyer. And then you have all the people that are going to be involved in implementation. You need to have them all on your side. Yeah. So in larger B2B sales, what he just said about stakeholders is so big that I just wanted to unpack that a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I learned about Korean uh, over the weekend, watching so many videos about him, is he's not just a sales guy. He's not just a marketing guy. He is an overall business wizard. And uh, one of the uh, shows that I watched you on about how to get a company ready to sell and all of the, that went into that. I said, Oh my gosh, I've got a PhD guy coming in and this is like a, a, a BA level show. And uh, we're going to have to elevate our game with uh, and make, make sure that we, we get as much wisdom and knowledge from Curry and as possible. So sorry, I took a minute to unpack. <laughs> that. Good. Let's go to story number four. Okay. So what you're talking about, though, let's just unpack what you just said, though. Okay. So sure. what we do is we go into a concept called role-based value propositions. And so the value proposition, so there's a stack of value propositions and they may be role-based or they may be just a, a stack within the actual role you're talking to. So uh, what does a snorer want? What does the person, you know, who is damaged by the snoring, who has to put up the snoring right. one? And those are two sets of value propositions, right? But in role-based value propositions in an organizational hier hierarchy, let's talk about how you would sell commercial insurance. 
uh, the CEO of the company knows we need to have commercial insurance that addresses our employees' uh, disability issues and, you know, emergency issues, that kind of stuff, right? So we know that. And we need to do that because our uh, board wants that. And the CFO is then going to say, okay, absolutely, we need that, but how much is it going to cost? And then the branch manager says, okay, that is good, but will it address these specific uh, items that we are facing on our factory floor here in Milwaukee? And there was a different than different uh, than other factory floors uh, down in Japan or wherever else it is. And then finally just keeps cascading down to the employee themselves on the floor. And his only question is, is this short-term or long-term disability? Okay. Uh, is this going to be something like is portable? You know, those, those are the kind of questions. And so each level goes in. And it's, this is, uh, I start off saying it's commercial insurance. It's actually disability insurance we're talking about, right? But um, you can see that what you focus on at the different levels of roles will be different. But the entire stack needs to be there in order for the policy to be bought, right? But what you emphasize at each level is going to be different. Okay, let's go to story number four. Story number four is the enemy we face. And the enemy we face is anything that provides polarity, you know, from where you are today to where you want to go and what's impeding you. That can be a person, that can be uh, organizations, that can be the weather. In Texas, you know, I was just down in Austin a couple of weeks ago. They had a nice little blitz there, you know, ice storm, et cetera. The place was absolutely shut down. Well, the weather is the enemy we face. And so now that allows you to assemble your forces to battle the enemy. And anything that allows you to coalesce your people's energies in the same direction allows you to focus that energy into something very positive, right? So, and enemy we face, you know, it doesn't always have to be something negative. You can either fight against something or you can fight for something. You can fight against childhood poverty or you can fight for adult literacy. Okay. And it's just a lens on how you do it. Opposite sides of the same coin. Yep. hundred percent. So what is it, Pete, in? Could be the weather. Could be a competitor. Could be a competitor. It could be our lack of really committing to our values and really executing well, right? It, it could be internal. It could be internal. Uh, absolutely. You know, sometimes the enemy we face is the enemy within, <laughs> right? Uh, here are the stated values. Management is not living up to it. Leadership is not leading up, uh, living up to it. You know, so what is it for? So now we have some, a large degree of what is a disillusionment and then resulting complacency with, eh, these guys don't really get it. So you're going to have a very lethargic organization uh, with that kind of thing. The enemy within is sometimes one of the worst enemies to face because they are not readily apparent. I got some great stories, uh, military stories around that uh, in the book. And, you know, it, it is very devastating to see that you are the problem. But unless you root that out, you know, it's very difficult to extinguish all of the ilk of <laughs> of bad things that can happen as a, as a result of that. Awesome. Number five, the mighty winds. Now, what I say is that every business is like a sail ship, not a power boat. It's a sail ship. And sailing ships, by definition, have to have wind to billow their sails. Right. So without the wind, you're going to sit still. If it's counter to if your ship is counter to the wind, uh, you are going to capsize. Uh, if the ship cannot fully take advantage of the prevailing winds, then you're going to be very inefficient. And the winds in this case are the seven macro, sorry, the six macro forces. So societal forces, technological, uh, uh, environmental economic, political, and legislative forces. Those are six forces. And when those six forces, if you are aligned with those forces, then you are using free energy of this wind, natural wind that's there. Now, I've got a great story about a fellow that uh, started a CD rental company in 1992, 93, booming business. Of course, what you do with the CDs is you took them home, you ripped off all the tracks and then you <laughs> gave back the rental the next day. Now you got your, you know, you burned your uh, new CD based on the rental you just bought. And he was doing a booming business, completely legal and away you go, right? He was doing so successful and we're up in Canada and he was doing so successful that he opened up another store in 1994 in Calgary, which is about 180 miles south of here. And he was just in time 
for the passage of NAFTA 1, the North American Free Trade Agreement. NAFTA 1, 1994. Mm -hmm. And that was the year that in the fine print, it absolutely outlawed the rental of compact discs. <laughs> Overnight, he had no business. Now, NAFTA wasn't negotiated overnight. It had been, uh, it was being negotiated for years, for years, right? So he or his lawyers for sure should have known that something was going to be afoot here. But uh, immediately, you know, the legislative win came in and completely capsized his ship. Wow. And so when we're addressing the mighty winds, a lot of this is self-education, right? It is being aware of these, these micro factors that can, you know, for instance, last week, guys, I said, you're negotiating, um, you, you're, you're negotiating a lease, but you haven't even, uh, done a, um, an inspection of, of the business. One of my, my dear friends, and dealers almost bought a multi-million dollar warehouse that was full of a, asbestos. It was literal, literally a, a killer. I, it killed the deal. But they love me forever because I brought that to their attention. Yeah. They're originally from another country, so they had no idea of asbestos. It's something us Americans take for granted, but they didn't have asbestos where they came uh, from, right. right? It was not a factor. It was not on their radar. And they, these are smart business guys. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and now if we relate that back asbestos to the, you know, the mighty winds aspect. Asbestos only became uh, illegal. I think the seventies, 1970s in the 1940s, and 1950s, I actually saw an ad where you could buy a little box of uh, asbestos, white asbestos, to sprinkle on your uh, Christmas tree for an artificial snow effect. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. You know, yeah, and you know, so one day it's legal, the other day, the next day it isn't. In 1898, heroin was marketed as the perfect cure to uh, morphine addiction. Heroin. 1898, the Bear Corporation, right? But of course, now legislatively it comes in and it's quickly outlawed because it's more addictive than morphine. And so, and it causes all sorts of other problems, right? You can, uh, you can snort it, you can smoke it, you can do all sorts of things. So it's easier to consume. So what's legal today may not be legal tomorrow. I'll give you one on values. And values is a big part of the demographics aspect of this, demographic psychographics. This generation of workers, you know, in their 20s, 30s, uh, they're much more values driven than paycheck driven. And so to have an organization that is aligned with the values that they have, and it could be a lot of things that have to do with societal, you know, uh, inclusion, okay, equity, diversion, that kind of thing, that's entirely possible. And if you're not, you know, aligned with that, the paycheck doesn't matter. I've got a friend of mine, uh, she works for a company that their whole business model, and this is a unicorn, their whole business model is uh, based in creating a goodness platform. Okay, and the goodness platform is to measure all the th good things that your company is doing uh, in, in the community and how your uh, employees can monitor, track, and actually participate in matching funds and what's going on because they understand that this is a big part of driving that engagement in their workforce. It's not just about paychecks anymore. Korean, I, I know from doing some background uh, research on you, that you do a lot of coaching and a lot of consulting when it comes to these, how does a business owner educate him or herself to be in tune with the things that they need to be in tune with to protect their business as they grow? So they don't get, um, you know, sidetracked by one of these things. I actually had, uh, a friend of mine years and years ago, he got legislated out of business. He started, he came up with a great idea. I'm going to put furniture and mattresses in, um, in these, uh, home in, in, in these, uh, the de little developments that are basically, uh, run, um, it's where they have open houses and they show their, their model homes. So he ran sales in model homes mm. and then he literally got legislated out by the regular brick and mortar stores, um, out of business, 
but it was a great idea. He was making a ton of money and, yeah. and, you know, local legislation came in and just did away with his business overnight. Yeah. How do we anticipate? How do we educate ourselves? I'm a big believer in the wisdom of crowds. Mm. And the wisdom of crowds is actually a book. By, I think it's James Surowiecki. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. So where it says that, it, where first of all, mobs have no wisdom. <laughs> but crowds that have some knowledge in the topic, and the, the individuals have some knowledge in the topic, where they have bias on, on that topic, they also have information on the topic. So the combined aspect of all this information together, all the information coalesces and the biases, positive bias and negative bias cancels out. So when you get peer groups together, you have a sufficient size of peer group, you go to conferences and such, where you share information about what they're seeing, what they're doing, what's worked, what hasn't. There's a lot of knowledge in real time that happens there. And so if you have the opportunity in the furniture business, the mattress business, to organize a peer group like that, you know, especially nationwide, uh, where you can see all these different types of things happening in the different regions of, of the country, then you're going to get a lot of lead information, lead, lead indicators of what's happening, what's working, what's not. And then you'll be able, you'll be able to more sufficiently uh, adapt and adopt what you need to do. I'm going to unpack that because it's so, so, so good. Um, peer groups in the mattress industry, when you go back to the beginning of the show, rewatch it, the mattress industry network group, that's a peer group. Uh, your buy-in group, that's a peer group. There are mastermind groups that you as a business owner need to belong to and you need to belong to them locally with other businesses in your community. So you know what's happening in your community. So important. I've been involved in masterminds for years and some of the knowledge that I've seen passed on between two different store owners, completely different businesses, but they, the one dude didn't know that the way this highway was running was changing and the other guy knew and he told him in time and he was able to pivot and make yeah. some adjustments. So a local mastermind group, but then a national mastermind group is huge. Yeah. A marketing mastermind group, a sales mastermind group, mm -hmm. a business mastermind group. These are all things that can be invaluable to you, but start simply with this. If you go, Pete, you know, those things cost money. I, I, I get that. I get that. So start by using your phone and reaching out to other people. You know, I have a great young business owner in Columbus, Ohio, and I, I just I, I love this guy's get up and go. I love how he goes out and he seeks answers and He'll say, I was talking to blah, blah, blah in Texas. I was talking to blah, blah, blah in Maine. I was talking to blah, blah, blah in Florida. And I'm like, that's great. Keep doing that. Keep reaching out to people, having real phone conversations with your peers that you see in the mattress industry group or that you just have met uh, at a market, perhaps, and really reach as deep into your industry as possible and into your community it might even be more important. So that's number five. And that's boy, the mighty wins that that's huge because huge. you could just get wiped out and not even know it. If you're just, you know, it, it's, it's good to focus on your business and to execute at each point. Yeah. But you have to be aware of what's happening around you, not so that you're solely focused and you're just getting blown around by the wind, but so that if it's really a mighty gale force when you know what it is, you can button down the hatches and you can be ready for it if it's that big. So anything else you want to add to my yeah, the, the winds don't care they create uh, you know tsunamis of opportunity and tidal waves of destruction in their path right um 1969 a little thing called the internet connected four computers to transfer files uh, but by 1994 it was the world wide web 
which by the 1990, late 1990s, early 2000s, have created multi-hundred billion dollar uh, industries, multi-hundred billion dollar industries and hundred billion dollar fortunes in its wake as well. And it has completely destroyed other industries. Uh, there's no such thing as a typewriter industry anymore. Everybody does their own word processing because they have access you know, to something as free as Google Docs or something as, uh, what is it, uh, available as Microsoft Word, right? But that's all part of the technology evolution of that internet and these uh, underlying uh, technologies of integrated circuits and microprocessors that allowed all of this power now to rest in an individual's hands. So once again, the, the macro winds don't care. Right. You just have to be really aware of them. And if you see this coming, you can pivot with it and you can take your customers with you yep. instead of just getting wiped out. Just getting wiped out. I, th I forget when it was you know, like in 1968, 1969, something like that, you know, early 70s for sure. Uh, Intel was in the microprocess. Uh, sorry, they were in the uh, dynamic random access memory business. So they're in the memory business. They could see no way out of this because the margins are just continually being compressed, 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 compressed. And the Japanese were just getting much more efficient at uh, producing uh, the, the, uh, the RAM, right? And being able to get a profit. They just could not catch the Japanese. So uh, Andy Groves, and uh, one of the other guys, I think it was uh, Gordon Moore, walked symbolically walked out the revolving turnstile at the front of the building, walked back in. That was their exit out of the RAM business and their entry into fully tripling down, doubling down on the Microsoft microprocessor business. And that's why they became the multi hundred billion dollar operation uh, that they eventually became. Now, they have other issues right now. But that was the dramatic turnaround, you know, that allowed them to focus on what was working. Where are the winds blowing to and what are they extinguishing in the process? Wow. What are they extinguishing in the process? Yeah. Stuart Segura, do you have some book and or tips on how to improve storytelling and business marketing? I am definitely weak in this area, and I feel like my story is kind of dull. I need to get over that. I, I've got a great book that, for you. I've got Stu, a great book for you. That's a great question, and I'm going to let uh, our friend Curian answer that. But I just want to say one thing. Thank you. Thank you for asking the question that everybody that was watching this uh, podcast was at. Ask, asking themselves, but didn't have the gumption to put it in. So thank you very much. And I am going to let Corinne answer your Stuart, question. I got a great book for you. It's called The Seven Essential Stories Charismatic Leaders Tell. <laughs> That's the book we're discussing today. Uh, you can find it on uh, Amazon. But if you come to my website, there's my website. There's the book. If you come to my uh, website, it's the seven uh, strategy peak on the right side. You can download a chapter plus an infographic that'll give you all seven stories. Right. So go grab that. It's free and uh, you'll be able to use use that this afternoon. Awesome. Thank you, Stu. Appreciate you. OK, where were we? Oh, number six. Number six. Six. OK, so the first five stories are the left side of the equation. And if they're believable, it is a foregone conclusion. Now, it equals story number six. Now, story number six is, well, it's obvious this is the journey we must undertake. So what do we have to do next? And so now we detail the journeys, different steps, processes, direction, based on what was conclusive evidence in the previous five stories. So the journey we must undertake now is a foregone conclusion in most people's minds if the first five stories were told, were told persuasively. And number seven. And the final one is number seven. And number seven is the why we will win story. Now, the why we will win story is a summation. It is uh, a shorter telling. It's, it's what we call a meta narrative of the previous six narratives, six short stories. And the seventh one is a summary of those previous six stories. It's a meta narrative. And the why we will win story adds one more key element. It's called a keystone, multiple keystones, maybe. And the keystones assure the win. 
So here's a common keystone. So you will have heard from history. Uh, God is with us, superior people, superior technology, superior strategy. And there are hundreds of them, absolute hundreds of them. But when people hear the why we will win story, now they are assured of victory. Right. So that's why they are now going to put all of their energies and efforts behind you. Now, one of the things that you're going to find is that out of 100 people in an organization, and I'm making these numbers up a little. Right. But out of 100 people, all 100 won't be true believers. <laughs> they won't be true believers. Uh, you, you know, the true believers may be seven or eight of those people. And you want to get to that core group of people that are then part of the social structure of the organization that can influence the other 90 and be able to bring everybody along. So you want to find your true believers in these seven stories. You want to find those true believers in your religion. And the religion is the core values of your business, right? It's not about worshiping a God. It's about, it's about adhering to the vision, the values, and the beliefs of the founders of the business and who the current leadership is because that story has to change to be remain current with the times. And so when we have those true believers in place, then you have stability in the organizational ship. Mm. Wow. So just so you know, I started off with a blank page. <laughs> Very good. And I started running out of places to write things. And I actually had to go over uh, the page. So anybody that has not already bought the book, the seven essential stories charismatic leaders tell uh, tell is huge. It's an Amazon bestseller. Go to his website. Did you say you could get it for free? How well, you, you can get it. Uh, well, not for free. You can get the infographic for free. And the infographic. It, it, yeah, it's an huge. infographic. It'll give you all seven stories and with a little example. So the book, but, but the Kindle version is three forty nine, right? I wanted to make it affordable, so no one's getting rich off of this. It's more about getting the information out there. I did this for my clients, uh, just to make sure that they had something in hand that they could quickly refer to. But you're going to find it entertaining. There's so many stories in there that are just, you know, very illustrative and very entertaining as well. Um, there's a great story. That, so the first half of the book is all about culture, okay? Because that's what you embed the seven stories into. And the culture of the organization, you know, there's going to be things like uh, the social organization, language and writing, uh, religion. We talked about religion, how you govern the forms of government in that organization, the economic systems, how you create value in, uh, in your company, uh, the arts, you know, how you take what you do at a core level and raise it to the level of an art. Customs and tradition would be the seventh, uh, seventh module, right? And so... When you have those uh, seven uh, pillars of culture, you know, and then infuse it with the seven stories, then you have the vibrancy of what that organization's potential is all about. There's a great story in there about economic systems and economic systems are, uh, what is it? How you create value, right? You know, what are the inputs? What are the outputs? Who you compete with? Uh, those kinds of things. And there's a great story in there about the world's oldest recorded customer complaint letter. Do you know when it was written? 1750 BCE. So that's 3,750 years ago, longer than that, actually. And it was uh, written on a clay tablet uh, <laughs> in cuneiform, right? And it was complaining about a substandard delivery of copper ingots from the Persian Gulf. And this, was, uh, this uh, tablet was uncovered in the city of Ur uh, in central Iraq. Uh, what is today central Iraq. And uh, this uh, fellow, uh, uh, there's two guys. Uh, Nanny was uh, the merchant that got the substandard ingots. And there's a metal producer in the Persian Gulf by the name of E. Nasser. And so this, this tablet is hilarious. It is identical to what you or I would write if we were completely incensed to Amazon customer service. How could you send me such stuff? You are, you ha hold me in contempt. I will not take this lightly, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, who, who do you think you are? All these kinds of things. And you know, the thing with this is that you and I can create this in about five minutes uh, in an email. This fellow, Nanny, must have been really ticked off because he would have had to go down to the clay tablet factory dictate it to a scribe. The scribe would have to put it in a wet clay. It had to be baked to harden. 
Then it was transported by donkey <laughs> to the Persian Gulf for delivery to the guy, you know, to the swindler by the name of Ian Asser. And so it was quite a uh, effort that, you know, nobody would have done if it was just a trivial matter. But, you know, often that's the kind of emotions that are involved, even at midnight when we're drafting those missives uh, to customer service. So, Chris, can you pull up um, Justin's comment? So the interesting thing about Justin Curian is he owns his own uh, distribution business. He's a consultant and he's a sales rep. He wears a lot of hats in our industry. He is one of the smartest guys in our industry. And Justin Trumbo has just said, this is great information. So thank you. Justin. That is off to you, Korean. Thank you, Justin. That means a lot coming from you. Do we have any questions that we didn't answer? It's oh, <laughs> Stu. I love Stu. It's only $15. Just go buy it. 100%. You know what? $15 for a book that if you just implement one thing out of it could change your business life is a very simple and easy decision uh, to, to make. And I would encourage everyone to do that. So let's wrap this up with this. I always like to give the last 10 minutes to my guests. What would you like to talk about other than what we've already talked about? <laughs> you have an exciting well, new coaching program going on? Talk, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, well, you know, there's so many things going on in the world today uh, that um, that uh, are directly related to what we're talking about. Because this, this is so genetic. It's part of the DNA of how humans, you know, interact with each other, see each other, uh, communicate with each other, obviously. Right? I read a great article uh, a few weeks ago about why human beings, uh, there's been about eight different migrations of hominids, uh, humans of different kinds, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, right? Let alone Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. And one of the clearest reasons that Homo sapiens, according to the article, uh, were able to dominate all the other uh, hominid migrations out of Africa was because of their ability to communicate and specifically allow that communicate to facilitate higher cooperation. And so I found that fascinating. And this idea of communication, what's the heart of communication? Facts are, you know, facts, you can communicate facts. That's not a problem. But when you communicate in the way of the stories that you tell, it is resonant and it's memorable. And for millions of years, you know, I think uh, humans first uh, learned to control fire about million seven hundred fifty thousand years ago, maybe two million years ago. No one really knows. But you you sat around fires at night. <laughs> what did you do around there? You know, eventually uh, human speech came about for the you know first maybe three hundred thousand years ago. Some say up to a million years ago. And what did you do with that human speech? You told stories around the fire. You know how this all came about. What to do next where this is going to go, heaven and hell, uh, what to do at the watering hole when you see a crocodile. That's a survivor, survival story. And you do all these kinds of things to be able to communicate, to embed knowledge, and to embed the culture, which is the operating system, to allow your tribe to move forward. And if we take a look at all our organizations, we're all sort of little tribes. You know, we're a little tribe, right? And we have our own culture, we have our own values, and we have our own directions, we have our own belief systems. And so when we have all these things together, what eventually dominates, you know, businesses don't dominate. Their stories dominate. Before, I, I, I'll give you a clearest example of that. I saw a 1955 uh, telling of the Fortune 500 list. Within 40 years, 80% of the 1955 Fortune 500 list was gone. Was gone. Studebaker was gone, right? They and the what happens is the company doesn't go first. The functional relevance and the emotional significance of their story dies first because mm. there are superior alternatives. And so that's what dies first. And so you have to continually renew and reinvent your stories. The core values don't change. 
Okay, uh, unless they're really dumb core values, right? You know, you don't see too many Nazis around running around in Germany anymore anyways, right? Uh, sort of outlawed at this point. But, you know, so those core values didn't stay. But the core values of things like, you know, uh, love and being able to protect your people and, you know, this idea that everybody should be able to participate uh, in, in some kind of uh, uh, direction of the company. And, the, you know, there's all sorts of different uh, core values. Those don't change, but the stories of how you communicate that to be relevant to this time have to adapt. And when we're talking about renewing and reinventing <clears throat> our stories as it relates to our business, tactically, what is the best way to do that? Is, is that usually from the inside out or the outside in? It's, it's both, I think. You know, so uh, we can't be insular. Uh, one of the clearest things that affect the stories of anybody, let alone any organization, is the technology that we face. And technology allows all sorts of uh, things to happen. Um, <laughs> I've got all sorts of examples. The microprocessor is one of the clearest examples uh, that happened. But, you know, before that, uh, it was the uh, transistor. And before that, it was the vacuum tube. Right. And then uh, on it goes to them. Before that, you know, the central underpinning of all this is electricity. Uh, so each invention or uh, or innovation allowed other technologies to then build on top of this. So you have to be very clearly aware of that. But then you have to be aware of the demographic. You have to be aware, aware of the, the directions of the governmental and legislative policy and all these kind of things from an internal. Now, what do we do that? I'm sorry, external. What do we do about that internally in order to adapt the ship? to take advantage of these new prevailing macro wins. Mm. That is so good. How do you coach business owners to communicate with their employees? The primary thing is story. You know, the, the primary thing is story. Uh, before that is that you have to live your values. And so in our company, so I have a digital marketing agency in addition to my strategy company. And we, are, we have about 30 people there. Our uh, values are clearly stated, absolutely clearly stated, right? And then there's sub uh, values uh, be, behind that. Uh, one of the clearest uh, values is mastery. Okay, so you, you have to be, what is it, uh, uh, masterful in what you're doing, continually learning. Another one is spirited. You have to be engaged and you have to have energy to move things forward. And the third value, the big header value, is people first. So we will always, leadership will always step in front of the train uh, for our people, as long as they are following these other, these other values that we have. And one of the clearest ways that we've been able to demonstrate that uh, recently is that we have had to let some people go. And that we didn't let them go for any necessarily competency issues. We let them go for values-oriented uh, issues. That's what it came down to. And, you know, when we tell the rest of the team about that, no one's surprised. No one's surprised because they can see that the, there's a deficit in the values they were demonstrating, the people that were let go, and the values that we claim to be important to the company. And so unless we're able to live that, uh, a statement of values doesn't mean anything unless you live it. Yeah. It, it's very it's very interesting that... Um, when you tolerate incompetence or bad attitudes or lack of performance, when you tolerate that, what you're saying with your actions to the rest of your team is it's okay, but it's not okay. And you lose stature in the eyes of your employees, when there is a disconnect between what you profess in your words and what you tolerate in your actions. Yeah. And those Culture. things have to line up. And sometimes we do have to make difficult decisions as business owners that we do have to let some people go because they're clearly their, their values are not lining up. Their performance is not lining up. Uh, you know, it's just not a fit any longer and they have to go or everything that you stand for becomes diminished yeah. and it's not easy. Um, and, 
And it just comes down to basically three things. A, did I define the expectations clearly? Two, did I give clear and consistent feedback? And three, after they refuse to comply, after all the communication that you have done consistently, then it's time to part ways. And yeah. it, it's not easy. It should not be done lightly. I, 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 I believe that we always need to work hard to bring out the best in people and to believe in them and to give them a good name and to make them live up to that good name that we give them. And when they don't, we do have to make those decisions and that's not always easy. Um, Culture is the, uh, based on not your highest aspiration, but the lowest form of behavior you will tolerate. That's mm -hmm. the culture. So your toleration, the minimum standard, is based in the culture. So you can aspire all you want, right? But it's yeah. pretty pretty clear to everybody where the buck actually lays. Yeah, that's that's incredible. What a joy. This is I mean, we basically packed into an hour a, a master class on on leadership uh within the the, the, the concept of these stories. And uh, we really kind of went deep on culture. And uh, I, I think it, it just all ties together. And, and, and guys, I want you to think about this. If, if you're just, it's just you and it's your wife and one delivery guy, think about what your stories are. Think about how important they're going to be when you have two or three or four stores. And don't plan on staying small forever unless you want to. But even then, these stories are important for you, no matter how big of a business you have and no matter how small of a business you have. It's, a, it's important to pay attention to all the little things and to really uh, strive for excellence in everything that we say or, and do. And I, I think you just had a great example of excellence in Korean and how he had at the, the tip of his fingers a story to tell us to drive his point across. Uh, so, Korean, there's somebody that's watching this and they're like, how do I get a hold of this dude? I want to talk to this guy. So, so uh, I wanted to quickly, uh, you know, if you're just the wife, uh, the, uh, the husband, the wife, the two owners, right, and the delivery guy, there's a great story that the delivery guy needs to know. You know, and I just thought of this, right? That's based on the format that we just used. Right? And that is the most important part of the sale is delivered in the last mile. And so the idea that the customer service aspect is not complete. Okay. And it's entirely in the hands of that delivery person for that last mile. And unless they understand the importance of that story, the bed's just going to be dropped off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, 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 but when the bed is in, you know, dropped off, the mattress is dropped off. That's actually the beginning of the next sale. Yes. Right. And 100%. so, so you need to embed that kind of story. Okay. How you get, how do you get a hold of me? Well, you see my uh, little uh, strategy peak logo down there, go to strategypeak.com. You can find all my contact information on there. Connect with me on LinkedIn and please go ahead. And on the bottom right uh, column, uh, the right hand column, You'll find a free link to the infographic. Please download that. You'll be able to implement that this afternoon. That's awesome. Korean, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, guys and gals, reach out to Korean. He is looking forward to communicating with you and helping you improve your business. Whether you need business coaching, sales coaching, marketing coaching, he's available for you. And grab his book while you're at it. If you don't get this book, I'm getting it uh, right now. And uh, I hope that you all grab it as soon as possible. And thank you so much, Kurian, for being on our show. Appreciate your time and appreciate all the pearls of wisdom that you passed on to us today. Pete, thanks for having me on your show. It was a treat. My very first in Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Thanks again.